Hey, what's up? Ed Gallo here, Wrestling for MMA Podcast, episode 8. I think this is 8. It's pretty cool. Uh, I've been, been one a week since we started, so I guess that's two months. Uh, but yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed last week's episode uh, with Hudson Taylor. Uh, that was super sick from you know a number of perspectives. One, just because he's so accomplished, uh, top five uh, panning records in NCAA history. Uh, and then just the way he talked about, you know, training and, you know, becoming a certain type of uh, athlete and the transition to jujitsu jiu- and obviously uh, his uh, nonprofit athlete ally as well. So if you haven't heard that one, please go back and listen to that one, because that meant a lot to, to Ben and I when we did that. Uh, but, yeah, we're just going to keep it rolling with guests. Uh, I've been very fortunate that uh, a bunch of my colleagues have been reaching out to get these interviews. I'm not particularly good at doing that networking, but they bring them to me and I'm very excited about it. Uh, but yeah, my, my guest today, uh, I have two guests, actually. Um, the first guest is a fellow colleague uh, at the fight site, Philippe uh, Marchetti, with a, with a K noise. Yeah, <laughs> Philippe Bouchard right Marchetti, yes. Well, yeah, you guys yeah. probably, if you know him, you probably know me. So I write for boxing and MMA for the fight site. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the featherweight division in the UFC. So I bought one of my former favorite featherweight in the UFC. Mm-hmm. For this podcast, I'm very excited about this. Yeah, we got right here, uh, you know, former ranked UFC uh, featherweight and uh, ultimate fighter runner-up, uh, just all around an awesome action fighter and wrestler, uh, Dennis Bermudez. So, uh, do you want to say hello to the people? Hi, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super, super pumped, super pumped. And uh, Philippe and I and a bunch of the other guys at the site. Uh, as much as we like consider ourselves elitists who really enjoy like oh the very very technical uh, put together like methodical fighters, we also love just the, like insane athletes who push crazy paces and like go to war and and do a lot of cool technical stuff but just in chaos. Uh, and a lot of people can't appreciate that because things are moving good so cover, fast. Good cover. You know what I mean? Uh, so much is happening. So they're like, oh, this guy, uh, you know, coming up, Justin Gaethje, a lot of people see him like that, where there's just so much action that they can't always see, you know, the finesse involved in, in what he's doing. And I felt sometimes you got a similar rap, but other times it was just undeniably beautiful what you're doing. But I'm going to rewind. And uh, I like to start with the beginning. Whenever I interview a wrestler, uh, I always like to ask, you know, their full story because usually, most of the time, someone who has a strong wrestling background, they started super young. Uh, I'm not positive on this, but that not, might not necessarily be true for you. So when did you get into the sport of wrestling and how did that happen? Uh, my next door neighbor, Spencer Christian, was the captain of the Surrey's High School wrestling team and he's seven years older than me. Gotcha. So I would go in the wrestling room and, and train with him and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, so I've been around wrestling for a long time. I just, it wasn't like available for me to really compete. Gotcha. And, uh, um, so I was able to actually start competing in seventh grade. Right. So I knew yeah. like, a, like a double leg, a half Nelson, a cradle, like in third grade. But then I, uh actually started to um, really start going to camps and, and trying to wrestle for real in seventh grade. So I started in seventh grade, what are you, 12, 13 then? Yeah, around there. Yeah. And then I've been with it ever since. Mm-hmm. And were you playing other sports in the lead up to that before you started wrestling? Bet your bottom dollar I was, dude. <laughs> uh, the first sport I ever played was soccer. I probably started playing soccer when I was like six or seven and i played that throughout the years tried baseball didn't work out awesome for me i played baseball for two years uh i started playing baseball in like second and third grade and the only reason i did that is because i'd go to my buddy's houses i'd ride my bike over there knock on the door like hey is greg home like no he's at baseball like all right Drop, ride my buddy's other buddy's house like hey is mark home no he's at baseball I'm like man i should fucking play baseball so i signed up for that reason but I had to call it quits because I was out in middle field. You know, that's where the fastest player on the team is at. And I really had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and there's no timeouts in baseball. So I pissed myself in center field. Oh, no. <laughs> but I had black baseball pants on, so it was hard to tell that I pissed myself. Uh, so there was that. And every time I got to swing, 
I'm going for I'm going I'm, I'm swinging for the fences. So, needless to say, I didn't uh, connect a lot. <laughs> so I'd go back to the dugout and I'd like kind of bury my head and I'd cry because I'm a sore lo- loser. And uh, I'm like, fuck this. This is a stupid sport. So, uh, but no. But then, like I said, in seventh grade, I ran track and field and I played football. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I, you know, I was going to guess if I had a chance to guess, I was going to guess football. Uh, that's because the, uh, a lot of things about you, I would say, I would say like the type of athleticism is very football uh, that you bring in. And, you know, I just, I had seen that you were like kind of a late starter relative to other people for wrestling. So I'm like, this guy had to have done something where you're, you're completing a lot of explosive movements to track and field football. That makes perfect sense. Um, so for people that don't know, uh, Wrestling in New York, I would say that's like a top five power state, very difficult yeah, state to, to wrestle in. Uh, yeah. So you ended up having a really awesome high school career. So how did that happen? How good were you to start, and how did you get to that level? So, um, so I, like I said, I, I, I ran track and field in the springtime, and then after 10th grade, I didn't beat my previous year. So in 9th grade, I ran a 4.59 mile, and then 10th grade, my best mile was 10.03. Mm. Sorry, 5.03. Yeah, Josh. <laughs> so I was like, man, because every after every year after wrestling, I would gain like 15 pounds of muscle because mm-hmm. I'm going through puberty and getting, you know, what I mean, I'm working out. So uh, I uh, was just like, man, I'm never gonna be able to beat that record. And like losing in the section finals, which is the tournament you need to win to go to states, yeah. like fucking crushed me all the. T- well, not the finals, just losing. Period, not going to the states would crush me, and that was my goal was to go to the states. So, after tenth grade, I said that's enough. So I just started uh, wrestling almost full all year round. So in eleventh grade, it turned up I went thirty three and four, and then my senior year I went thirty four and three. Both times I was a section runner up. So when I was wrestling, you had to win the section to go to the states. So I was a two time runner up, and both guys I lost to ended up placing fifth. And then, like, throughout the, you know, the the years, like, training at wrestling clubs and stuff like that and wrestling in off tournaments, like, I'd be beating state champs and shit like that. And, like, and then just when it came to my time to, like, make it happen, uh, fucking geez. choked. Jeez. But, you know, obviously it did well enough to get some attention from D1 coaches. You ended up going to Bloomsburg. No, was there other, I were there other offers? You walked on? Whoa. Yeah. Ballsy. <laughs> well, so here's so uh, Bloomsburg University. My my uh, my great grandfather was a president there for 30 years. Uh, so I was a shoe in. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. The only reason I took my SATs was to uh, clear. Uh, was it the clearinghouse? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Which I did. So I was a prop 48 the first year, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, we kicked ass, and I just, I just, I wasn't, I was like middle of the pack, mm-hmm. but obviously you have to be like the best in your, you know, weight to be the starter. So I worked my All ass right. off and got a starting uh, spot, and then I earned a little scholarship. Nice. So yeah. Yeah, and you, uh, you took a red shirt your your first year, is that right? And then you were red varsity shirt, for two years. Same thing. Gotcha. Yeah, two years as a starter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how did that progression go? Like, what kind of things were you doing that you know you felt like you're getting better? What was working with your style? Just kind of give us a picture of what that looked like. Um. Yeah, I figured out. You know, my fighting style was a lot like my wrestling style. Uh, in college, I figured out I have a better gas tank than a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. So pull their head, pull, 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 move, 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 and just get them tired. Because I wasn't technically the best guy. So the, I'd lose the first round. The second round would be close, and the third round, I would, or the third period, I'd crush them because they were so tired. So that was the the only thing is is looking back at my career. There's not a ton of longevity in wrestling like that. So mm-hmm. by the time nationals came or whatever, I was fucking pretty tired from doing yeah. that day in and day out since August. You know, so March rolled around. I was like, dude, I just want to fucking. This sucks. I don't want to, you know. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And you end up, uh, you know, sticking out the rest of your career. Uh, it looks like you just had those two years uh, as a starter, and then it was on to MMA after that, right? Well, what had happened 
was your boy is pretty smooth with the ladies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I uh, there's this girl that was like a you know I I'd known her for many years. She was like doing some modeling near my college. I'm like, hey, come over. Came over, we partied, we did the dirty, if you know what I'm saying, right? And then, like seven months later, she's like, I'm pregnant, and it's your kid. I'm like, what? No, you're not, because no, you're not. <laughs> uh, and then I saw her, and she was very pregnant. I'm like, oh, shit. So I pretty much dropped everything. I tried to wrestle the third year, and I did a little bit. I wrestled, like, at the – but I was only going to school, like, twice a week. Uh-huh. And the other days, I was working two jobs. And I wrestled in the, what, the Ohio, no, Michigan State Open. Oh, the Open, Just yeah, because tough. you could enter two guys in a weight class early. And my coach was like, you know, you're still beating guys. Like, so mm-hmm. I did that, even though I was only wrestling twice a week. And that just got too much to do. So I dropped out my senior year, was working two jobs, raised his family. And then two years uh, into being a dad, I found out the kid wasn't mine. Now, during that period of time, MMA was on a fucking huge rise where people were coming up to me because they know I'm a good wrestler and my, my build. And they would tell me, like, hey, Dennis, you got to get into this MMA stuff. Like, I think you'd crush it. I'm like, I know I'd crush it. <laughs> but, you know, working two jobs, kid, I, I just don't have the time. So then when I found out the kid wasn't mine, this shit talking that I was doing in my head, I was like, I got to back this up. Like, you're talking all this shit like how you'd be good at MMA. You got to do it now, dude. I was like, I don't want to. And I was go- they were just going back and forth with myself, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, so remember I was talking about Spencer Christian, the guy that got me into wrestling? Yeah. His older brother had been, like, coaching some guys for MMA. I went down, did a workout. Do you remember Joey Gambino? He, only had he, fought, he fought in the UFC, UFC, yeah. He has a cage tattoo on him, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> yes, so I do remember him. So that's my younger brother's best friend. <laughs> gotcha. Growing up. So I used to beat him up on the trampoline all the time. And then he knew I had a good uh, wrestling background. So he asked me to come down and train with him, work wrestling. So obviously, it goes from just wrestling to now we're doing MMA and submissions and shit like that. And I didn't know anything. So I just like gave him a few neck cranks and shit like that. And I was tapping it out. And, and my buddy was like, dude, Dennis, you should fucking do this. Like, I think you, like, there's, a, there's a fight at the end of this month. You should, I, I'll sign you up. I'm like, dude, what do you mean? I trained one time today. <laughs> and now you're signing up for a fight. He's like, yeah, you'll fucking crush him. I'm like, you sure? He's like, yes. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so with one day of training, I was signed up for an MMA fight, but I didn't live. So my buddy lived upstate New York and Joey Gambino and and my buddy Tyrone. But I was living in Pennsylvania at the time Mm -hmm. near Harrisburg. So I'm signed up for a fight. I'm like, man, I'd I'd better start training for this because I don't know anything. I know how to shoot a fucking mean double leg and I got a mean full Nelson. Uh, so then I walked into Blackman MMA, which is, you know, the best MMA gym at the time in that area. And I, I went up to Steve Blackman. I said, who's your best guy? I got to, you know, he's like, he's in the back. So I don't know if you remember Jeff Smith. He had tried out for the ultimate fighter and had, he lost a bullshit, uh, decision. It's when you only had one round to win. Mm -hmm. It was a season right after mine, I think. So the live one, right? Yeah. So the thing is, is like, he was kind of being the guy up on the feet. He shot a takedown, maybe it got stuffed. So the guy was on top and Jeff was just going after submission, after submission, after submission. And this guy was just trying not to get tapped out. And they gave the win to that guy. Jeez. But anyway, so I go in the back of Steve Blackman's and I'm training with Jeff Smith and a few other guys. And uh, that's where it started. Um, and uh, so I, at first it was just, I'm training for this fight, I signed up. So by a week in the training there, I'm signed up for another fight. I haven't fought one time, I'm signed up for two fights. 
one that month, the one the next month. And uh, some of the guys, then I do those fights, and some of the guys in that gym start turning pro, and I'm already beating them. I'm like, what? You're pro? How are you pro? Like, I'm, I'm two and I'm amateur, and I'm beating it, you know? And they're like, right. tell me how much they're making. I'm like, what? I'm like, sign me up now. So after I got 4 0 pro, I fought with the Pennsylvania Athletic Commission to turn me pro. Um, They're tough, though. <laughs> yeah, and then I TKO'd my my first guy, first pro fight. And I made four hundred dollars a fight and four hundred dollars a win. I was like, "Who wants to go out?" <laughs> Thanks, on your boy. I'll pay for everything. I'm rich. Because at the time, I was working at UPS, making one hundred twenty five dollars, and I lived with my mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Appealing. So, <laughs> so that week I made nine hundred and twenty-five dollars. One, <laughs> I made eight hundred dollars in fucking like four minutes, and then I made the other one hundred and twenty-five after working, you know, twenty hours. Uh, so yeah, so then I just started. I'm like, what? I'll fight every week. So my first year of MMA, I fought nine times. Gosh. Four amateur and five pro fights. Because, I mean, I was just, you know, it was off of this wrestling mentality of mm-hmm. just, like, we compete every weekend. Why, you know what I mean? So, for me, competing once a month was fucking nothing, you know? Um, and then, you know, the more I fought, the more money I was making. And it, after each win, you'd make more money the next, the next bout. So, I'm like, dude, this is mm-hmm. some, you know, I'm like 5-0 and o pro. I'm like... I think I could be in the UFC. So some people hit me up to try out for the Ultimate Fighter, uh, and I originally tried out for 155, the season that uh, Michael Johnson was on, Mm -hmm. and those guys. GSP season, yeah. Uh, I made it to the finale where they give you the final interview and get you do all the like cat scans and make sure you're not on fucking steroids and shit like that. and they never called me back after two weeks. I'm like, fuck. So then, th- that, you know, that episode of The Ultimate Fighter happens. And then there was the, uh, hang on one second. Uh, and then there was the 145-pound uh, season. And my buddy hit me up randomly. He was like, hey, dude. They're doing 145. You should drop down to 145 and try because I had always fought at 155 prior. Right. So I was like, "Fuck it." So I hit up the UFC or my contact and I said, uh, "You guys told me next time you guys do an episode of 155, I didn't have to do like the physical tryout. I could just fly out for the interview." Mm-hmm. I said, "Does that apply for 145?" They said, "Yes." I'm like, "All right." So they flew me out to Vegas to do the final interview. And then I'm in there talking to the guys. They're like, oh, we remember you. We liked you a lot for 155. We just thought you were too small. I was like, oh, fuck. What do you mean too small? I was undefeated while I was in here, you son of a bitch. How am I too small? I think I was like 6-0 and pro at the time. How are you tell me I'm too small? Uh, so anyways, so they're like, all right, we got you. Know, you're on board. So I did the ultimate fighter. Uh, that was cool. And then I got into UFC. And today is actually my first UFC fight outside of, uh, the Ultimate Fighter. Whoa. I fought Pablo Garza. I thought about coming out with a sombrero and shit like that because he's Mexican. But I didn't. (laughs) So, Dennis, uh, you know, early on when you're, when you're transitioning, because this is all happening so fast. Uh, yeah. you know what I mean? So you don't have a ton of time to like raise your skill competency as you're going. You're just kind of doing what you know. Um, which is funny because you like, you can see like you like gritting your way through a lot of situations early on, especially in the ultimate fighter. I remember, uh, the, the Akira Khorasani fight, like, cause you know, as a viewer, you don't, you don't like Akira Khorasani and you really want you to win that fight. And it doesn't look getting, good early. You're getting hit. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. diving into, into submissions and stuff like that. And just, you know, coming at his legs. But, like, the chain wrestling and the pressure and the pace is, is really seeing you through. So, I guess, in a general sense, what did you find was working for you really well in those early fights? And what kind of stuff wasn't working for you that might have, like, in college or early on? 
what worked for me in those early fights is that any given time that I wanted the fight to go to the ground, mm-hmm. I would figure it out. Like it was going to the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, Were those similar attacks that you were hitting in college? Like, was your wrestling style uh, translating? Yeah, but just way more hand fighting and setups and stuff like that. You know, like fucking three fakes before I actually shoot the shot and like fucking four head pulls, you know, while, while, uh-huh. while with my hand on the wrist. Whereas MMA, it's instead of like three misdirections, it's like three jabs and then a shot, you know. Mm-hmm. So or, you're treating yeah, strikes the same like, way as, yeah. In wrestling, you would push and they would, if you push them, they'd push back and they could level take the shot. In mm-hmm. MMA, I would jab, take a step back when they went to jab me and level change, hit the double. Do you, you figure that I, out on your own or did someone teach you that? That was that, that was a lot. Of, I just figured it out on my own. And it's funny because I would get very high level uh, wrestlers. And I'd be like, yo, man, like, it seems like when you're not in your wrestling stance, you move like a goddamn robot. Like my buddy Gregor Gillespie and my buddy Chris Wade. Both New York State champs, both wrestled Division One. Gregor was a national champion, and I'm just like, dude, what? Like, I don't get. I would try to put fighting in terms of wrestling so they could grasp grasp the idea better, you know? Because mm-hmm. that's kind of what I did a little bit. But like, I'm the Ultimate Fighter. You could see, or even my first time fighting, you could see I'm very, very like your average wrestler, like kind of stiff and like standing straight up, like I'm a goddamn kickboxer. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas I evolved with my MMA, you see that my stance kind of get a little lower, my shoulders get looser, my punches come from different angles and the setups and the movement, you know. Um, and it's funny when I watch back at those Ultimate Fighter, uh, mm, like, how, yeah. like, man, you fucking sucked. <laughs> but that was, hey, can, on, that menace just... was a scary motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Because he gave zero fucks. He didn't if I can just bounce back quickly on, on this fight. What's up, Felipe? Yeah, I would just say, what, while you mentioned your transition to wrestling and MMA and talking about the Ultimate Fighter, actually, do you remember when you fought Jimmy Ribeiro, the yeah. first fight you got? So he was super athletic at 145 even at this point, and the first one was like a tough one for you. And he got you down, and he, he had your... Back control, you had the body triangle, but it was like kind of not very good setup. He was a bit on the side. And you defended with like two hands on one. And with his left hand that was free, he did nothing. And like even his coach had to tell him, dude, he has two hands on one. You have one free hand. Punch Dennis with the hand. And then he only did it once the coach tell him to do. And in the second one, when you got uh, back control on him, you just smoked him. Like the difference from like the understanding of end fighting and risk control were just like crazy different. Is it something you realized pretty quick in that one that he wasn't as educated as you already were at this point? I um I don't know if he wasn't educated because here's how that fight went out. So I went out there, I'm like, man, I'm actually fighting someone who's shorter than me. This has <laughs> never happened in my life. I don't even know how to fight this guy. I'm actually going to have reach for once. This is insane. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to beat the shit this little fuck. <laughs> so I go out there, and it just does not go good. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. The, the, it's, it's crazy when I look back at it. It's like, going back to the corner, I, there was no panic. I don't know why. Maybe I was in shock. I don't fucking know. I remember going back the corner. And uh, Usman was in my corner, Mar Usman, and then uh, Ryan Parsons, who then became my manager. Oh. They're, they're telling me what to do. They're like, dude, you got to do this, that, and the other thing. I, I, I looked at them both in the eyes and said, I got this. And they were like, what? You just got your fucking <laughs> ass kicked. You're looking at me dead in the eyes telling me you got this. And they just met me like 15 minutes in the back. Like, they have no idea who the fuck I am. I don't know who they are. But I looked at them like, I got this. And they're like, okay. I'm like, no, you don't, but go ahead. Do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> and then I went out there, dropped them, fucking got on top. So one of my things was, like, a concept that I, I gathered real quick in MMA was if I get double legs in and just lock you out, so I would do it in wrestling, like, you can't get the fuck up. 
lock whatever you want. I'm going to punch your damn face in. If you try to push up, I'm going to really land some shit. So when I would get double legs in on people, I would make sure I keep them flat first, punch second. Right? So, I mean, I'll, we'll say that for the full round. It's when people punch first and flatten. So, like, so let's say they flatten them and the guy starts building up and they keep trying to chase the punch. Then the guy can get out. You mm-hmm. lock those legs out first, kick out the arms, and then go back to what you were doing, you know? And uh, that's what I did. And then, you know, that's why I was the first pick for Team Mayhem. Mm-hmm. But they're like, oh, okay. this guy, there's something about this guy. He just got fucking his shit pushed in. <laughs> and then he looked us in the eyes and said, I got this. Got well, there's something you did actually between two the two ones that was different, talking about fighting someone smaller. Is that when you start the fight, you start with those front kicks and you kept countering all of those. Like maybe you thought the distance would be enough that the kicks would land. And in the second one, he didn't land kicks, just fainted the jab, wait for him to react and shot under. Maybe that was a different. Well, what happened was, so, you know, I throw my combos and he'd punch me and then I would stop. He would stop my combos. And, or like he'd punch me and I would, I would throw my combo. And I remember going the second round, like, listen. You're getting hit anyways, so you might as well throw your shit. And that's what I did. That's why I hooked up that that left. Yeah. Dropped him. Is I just fuck if he hits you, just keep just finish your combo. Don't eat like almost go. I went in like robot mode where fuck it, you know. Awesome. So if you're on a roll, you can just you, let's. I'll no, no, I don't want just because I, I knew good. that fight. We could <laughs> mention it one time and get it out of the way because what happens after is. There's so many cool stuff that you did later in your career. That's crazy that we can talk mm-hmm. later. But I was just wondering something because uh, I forgot to ask. Uh... Hang on real quick. Before this interview goes any further, how the hell do you guys know each other? Oh, it could have been. I lived in New York, so it could have been is... that, but it's not even that. <laughs> what? I used to live in New York, so we could have met like this, but it's not even like this. Yeah. We met online. We met online. Yeah, yeah. He works for me. Yeah, there was like, there's maybe like 20 educated fans online, and we were like two of them. Okay. So we started a website. <laughs> on, on, on what on what form? Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Chad Mendes. Yeah, I follow you. You don't follow me, though, but I follow you. Yeah, you're right, I don't. And uh, Chad Mendes is my favorite MMA was, uh, fighter. He's probably his, too. Yeah, that's so, a, that was a, a big. Help probably one of the first things we might have to do, like like Chad is the best, something stupid, and and we start going like this. <laughs> hey, what? Our mutual love of Chad Mendez is, is part of oh, what brought us yeah, together. Oh yeah, I get that fucker on my show. I, if you yeah, get same him, thing. send send him our way afterwards. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you deserve him more than us, though. You no, go on a I hunting trip with him. I think I don't. I don't know why. Because, like, he'll respond to me, and then I'll, like, hey, man, we got to get in the show. Crickets. I'm, like, man. Why don't you go hunting with him? Because he lives across the country. Yeah. Doesn't help. <laughs> can... That's the way to his heart, though, for sure. I know. Well, that's why I'm, like, hey, man, let's come on my show. We'll talk about hunting, skinning buffalo, and fucking fishing and shit. And then we want to talk about <laughs> I don't want to talk to you about your career, but I do. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. No, Chad Mendez is actually, he's one of the motherfuckers that in my career, I'm like, ah, I really don't want to fight him. <laughs> like, he's fights exactly like I fight and looks kind of like me. Like, I don't want to fight me. Handsome, strong as fuck, muscle, you know what I mean? Short, mm-hmm. tan. Yeah. My favorite kind of fighter. Yeah. There's a reason why you're on the show, Dennis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we type. love fighters <laughs> like this, though. So. Yeah. All right, all right. Keep going. What else we got? Oh, Philippe, it's all you. This is your second. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just saying, like, as you were still pretty young in your MMA career when you were on the Ultimate Fighter, is the fact that you have, like, guys like uh, J.M. Miller uh, and no audience, you know, while you fight, you can hear your corner pretty easily. Is it stuff that help or not at all? Oh, in, while I was in the house fighting? It's kind of like training. Like, whenever I was far, like, back home, whatever like that, it's like me and another guy, he's got, like, his coach, or maybe we have the same coach, or maybe it's a, another training partner, and, like, he's listening for tips for that, and same with me. 
So it, it was intimate like that. And that's that's another thing, too, with these fights that are happening now that there's nobody in the stands. It's almost like kind of training, you know? Like when I fought, I, when I fought Jimmy Rivera, we were fighting in the MGM fucking stadium. And there was nobody there. It was just Dana, Mayhem Miller, Michael Bisping, and then all the other guys trying to – actually, not, that was it. There was some cameraman, some cut man and shit like that. Uh, and then all the other guys were in the back getting ready for their fights that were trying out for the show. So in MGM, there was like maybe 15 people max. And me and two of them was me and the other guy throwing down, <laughs> you know. So I don't know. It's kind of like training where I that maybe that's why there was no like panic when I was going back to this in between rounds. It was just like you know, it was kind of like sparring. Like all right, let's yeah. see this guy up next round. Nope. You know. You know how I do. <laughs> I don't, but now I know, yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. You follow me on Twitter. You know how I do. Yeah. I tell you what, most of my tweets are when I'm driving. Sounds dangerous. I I yeah. fought for a living. <laughs> I tried to name my son's middle <laughs> name Danger. I can't, like, I can't knock your lifestyle. It's gotten you this far. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Right, Philippe, it's it's your section, man. Dive in. No, you can go back. I already I have nothing. interrupted that was all it. the podcast. That was all I had. Oh, well, I the, maybe listening. no. Now you can talk wrestling with Denis. And okay, I was just gonna say, like, I'm very impressed how quickly your striking improved. Like, you, you never trained kickboxing anything before starting MMA. No, my so like when I wow. first started fighting, I think the reason why I had some success is because. I could wrestle like a motherfucker, and I wasn't. I was trying to knock your fucking head off, and I wasn't afraid that you were trying to knock off mine. Mm-hmm. You know. And then if I start like, I would keep every fight standing the whole time unless you hit me pretty hard. I'm like, all right, let's change this up because you can't <laughs> hit me really hard if you're on your back. But if I'm fucking you up, I'm gonna stay there because it's way easier to kickbox than it is to wrestle. It requires less oxygen. Yeah, but like, I I love that you said I I don't doubt you were super tough and everything, but you did some fucking super smart stuff, even with your striking. Like, there's some setup that you use that were really like high level. Like, there's some dudes who were in your division at the time that were mostly strikers that don't sell off their strike as well as you did at some point in your career. Like, I feel like at some point, like, there's a fight. I feel you were so pissed off when you were in that fight against Jimmy S. G- help me head with the name Jimmy yeah, LS. Jimmy the Hattis. fight you, you, you fought after Matt Grice. Yeah. First thing you did that I love is that during when you walked out, you fist bump Matt Grice. That was dope. <laughs> no, that was <laughs> and... when I fought uh, uh, Clay Guida. Mm-hmm. Are you yeah, okay? Maybe. I but what... Clay Guida, as I was coming out, Matt Grice was there. He'd already been the car accident. Yeah. And, uh, I think it Jimmy it because you were so mad, not mad, but you looked like you wanted to prove something because at the time people they probably forgot a bit about him, but he was like not undefeated, but he was talked a lot about like a guy well, who would Jimmy, you. Jimmy Hedis and me were like neck and neck for the most takedowns in the uh, UFC at the time. So for me, and people were like, hey man, he's got you, he's probably gonna take you down. I was like, he ain't taking down shit. <laughs> I fucking. <laughs> Yeah, fuck his ass up. Yeah, like you did some stuff. When I mean mention mentioning the mixing the wrestling with the strike is that you will get like the single color tie, like like if you were gonna punch him in the clinch, but actually you will push him back and distract him with the right hand and get your inside trip while you punch him so he doesn't see it and get him on the ground. There was, and then you will do the same thing, but instead of really grabbing the neck, you will just set up the frame and get your right hand. So those stuff, it's people who truly understand. All the weapons there, like there's so many people that are not able to set up both stuff. So it's not just about being tough and moving forward. You are a super smart fighter, man. Yeah. Well, the thing about fighting Jimmy Hedis is I knew if I fought with my hands down, he could knock me out. 
So I was like, I'm not fucking. It's a free for all. It's like me kicking the shit of him. I just can't let him fucking take me down because he actually is pretty crafty with his uh, submissions. So it was like, just fuck him up on the feet because he can't touch me on my feet. And my wrestling superior to his judo. Like the only person that has good judo is fucking Ronda Rousey. And the only reason she has good judo is because she was going against <laughs> fucking girls that couldn't wrestle. Factor it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. No, but you know she's Olympian, and 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 uh, I I watched Jimmy has fuck up a bunch of other dudes. I was like, damn. I just was just like, not happening. I don't care. Like when I look at his body and his face, like you can't beat me. You don't have the muscle mass, and there doesn't look like there's a mean bone in your fucking body. You're not beating me. You know. I've trained with uh, Jimmy. He's super nice. I agree. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, good dude. And the thing is, is me and him were actually fighting in the same area before we both made the UFC. So he was fighting near the Scranton area, and I was fighting mm-hmm. in Harrisburg, which is only, like, an hour and a half right. apart. So, like, when we were coming up through the ranks, people were like, yo, you should fight this guy over here. Like, no one can touch him. I'm like, I'll fucking crush him. Uh, <laughs> but I'm really glad it got saved for the UFC, because that was that easy money. Yeah, oh, you got performance of the night for this, right? Yeah. Back to back with with the Guida fight, I think. Yeah, that was a hey, that was good. That was your point. Hey, until tax season hit. They were ah, like, hey yeah. Dennis, you owe us thirty seven grand. I said, hey, you guys are fucking robbers. <laughs> and I wrote the check, and I like. Then I called my brother, who works for, who is in the Coast Guard. I said. Fuck you. Fuck the government. You guys are fucking robbers. He's like, Dennis, I don't work for, like, <laughs> I work for the government, but, like, I'm not taking your money. I said, Jay, go fucking take your fist and shove it up your ass. <laughs> Tough day. The biggest check I've ever wrote, the second biggest check I've ever wrote was for taxes. The first is for my damn house. Speaking of Clay Guida, did you ever get to uh, like train with him one on one in any like more formal context? I'm wondering what he's like in like a straight wrestling session. You know what I mean? Uh, well, the thing, uh, what's funny is so in November of 2011, I was preparing for the Ultimate Fighter finale, mm-hmm. and my old um, wrestling club, Journeyman Wrestling, had me, Clay Guida, and Chael Sun in there for a clinic. And at the time, I'm like, man, these guys are like fucking complete studs. But at the time, Clay was also wrestling at, at uh, was fighting at 155. So I never thought he would ever come down to 45, you know? And then when he did, he was very easy to get ready for. Because he's Clay Guida. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> Getting ready for someone... Jimmy Hedis was pretty easy... Well... Jimmy Hedis was easy to mentally prepare for. Like, I just know I could crush him. And, like... And, and then the thing was, like... If I lose to this, like... In my eyes, he just... There's no muscle. He's like a boy, kind of. Like, he looks like a 15-year-old <laughs> boy. You know? Like... If I lose to him, like, I got to reconsider what the fuck I'm even doing here. <coughs> so, beating Clay Guida was like a reward. Beating Jimmy Hennis was like, dude, if you don't, there's going to be consequences. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, but like I said, fight, getting ready to fight for <coughs> Clay Guida was... Awesome. Like, getting ready to fight Matt Grace. I didn't know who the fuck he was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, it was just getting ready. But I'm getting ready to fight Clay Guida, you know? Or getting ready to fight someone who's ranked higher than you. You can, like, wake up like, I want that. Mm-hmm. What he has, I'm going to take it. Getting ready to fight someone that you've never, like, just, hey, I'm in the UFC. Like, everyone in the UFC is fucking tough. Fuck. I wake up and, like, get myself, you know? 
Because mm-hmm. at the time, I was fighting for like 20 and 20. It wasn't like, man, if I win this, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> like, man, if I win this, like, I'll be able to pay a month for or rent for right. like, three months. For sure. Yeah. You've talked a few times about, uh, you know, what people feel like, you know, physically you know, being stronger than them. Did you feel like it was just your athletic career carrying over? Or did you do some serious strength and conditioning work? And what kind of stuff were you doing throughout your career to maintain I, that? I've always uh, lifted. Um, but because I have, like, Napoleon syndrome, <laughs> I uh, was always, like, the smaller kid in, in school and stuff like that. So I would lift and work out and run just so I could be better than people at shit. You know? Like, yeah, you're taller than me and, like, whatever, but, like, I can do more pull-ups than you, you fucking pussy, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that became my, like, and that's how I, like, handled problems, I guess, is I would just, like, go work out, you know? Uh-huh. Um, so it's just been, like, an appointment syndrome that's always, like, kind of stuck with me, but now it's gone because I don't really care. I'm mm-hmm. not competing for it. Like, my whole life... I've been competing with <coughs> people and things. But now I'm not. So it's like, fuck, man. I actually got to work out to just look good. It's tough. <laughs> uh, Being around a lot of other MMA fighters, did you think that their like strength and conditioning routines were, were up to par with what you were doing? Or did you notice that as like, a deficit area? Um, No, I knew everyone's working out and stuff like that. Like, I've definitely grabbed people and done whatever I wanted to them. Mm-hmm. But I can never say that ever happened to me. You know, I've watched people get, I've watched people grab other people. I'm like, man, he just can't stop him from doing that, you know? Mm-hmm. Which sometimes, I mean, if it wasn't, like, that was going to be a reason why I would ever hang up the gloves was because, like, man, that other guy who weighs exact same as me did whatever he wanted to me. There's nothing I could do about it. Mm-hmm. And I was manhandled. That's never happened to me, you know. Um, but those three bullshit split decisions in a row, which were equivalent to 150 grand, and I have kids, like, like fuck that. I'm going to have three guys that don't know what the fuck they're watching decide if I'm going to get paid or not. That's the real yeah, that reason was- I walked away from the sport. And the last fight wasn't, it was just, I was going through, like, a relationship problem where, you know, I was with this girl, and she fucking moved out, whatever, and I was just like, yo, someone's got to (laughs) pay. I was just upset. And I'm like, yo, I'm fucking somebody up. Yo, call my manager, like, hey, remember I told you I don't really want, I think I'm done fighting? Line another one up. So, that's that's all about. Did it help? Fuck yeah, man. I made a hundred grand. <laughs> nice. Good to hear. Yeah. Philippe, did you have other, you know, fight specific questions you had on your mind? I know you yeah, got a lot of technical like, details. Did you when you grew up, did you you mentioned doing football and thing when you were a kid? Did you like boxing or even like wrestling? Someone you you liked when you were like a teenager or a kid? Uh I was in sixth grade, I was really into WWF. Okay. And I was really pissed when they got sued and had to change it to WWE. I still call it WWF. <laughs> That's what it is. All right. Um, yeah, so I was really into that. So I was like kicking my friends in the balls and fucking giving them the stunner in class. And then uh, boxing. Like, I really liked Mike Tyson. I thought he was really cool growing up. And I also liked. Uh, but I never, like, sat down as a youngster and, like, watched his fight from, like, him coming. I would just, like, see, you know, they were only, like, a couple rounds anyways. But I mean, his fights that went to the decision, I didn't stick around for the whole thing. I was there mm-hmm. for the three rounds. And after that, I'm like, ah, I have ADD. I got to get out of here and run around the house, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then I also liked Felix Trinidad only because he was Puerto Rican. And I was Puerto Rican. Well, still am. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, great. What do you think is your best fight, your best performance in your career? There's, y- yes, I've had really good performances. It's like, but I'm for different reasons. Like for like, uh, 
the most like gut and grit and like pushing was against Matt Grice where like yeah. every like when I finished that fight, everything was left in there. Like I couldn't breathe. I was surprised I could, you know, like, <clears throat> like just gasping for air because I just fucking wasn't going to let him beat me. Uh, but in terms of like just being fucking sharp and on point was probably against Clay Guida. Mm-hmm. Like I like, I'm not a fucking submission technician. He gave up because he was like, I'm not being this guy. Yeah, I don't want to be here anymore. Like I was, yeah. everything he punched, I was pinpointed on him. Like when he came in, I locked on him, and I had the thing is like one of the reasons why I got in MMA is because I would get drunk and sit on the couch with my buddies and watch these guys fight like Donald Cerrone and and Pettis and Clay Guida. I'm like, dude, I would fucking take him down so easily and he wouldn't get up because I would fucking ride him like a fucking pony. You know? So Clay Guida being one of those guys that I thought I could beat before I started fighting. (laughs) So then when I got the opportunity to fight him, I'm like, oh, I'm a fucking buddy of bread. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, never never got to train with Clay. Um, after the fight, I was drunk at the bar at the hotel. And he walked in. I'm like, "Yo, Clay!" And he looked. I'm like, "Yo, man, you want to have a beer?" And he's like, "No, I'm good." Uh, whatever, pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get you a beer. I don't want it. Whatever. Here's a question: In training. Who's the toughest guy to wrestle that you wouldn't expect? Or, like, someone that doesn't have a wrestling background that ended up being pretty good in that in that sense? Around your weight class. Oh. Well, everybody I work with had that. Can Like, if you didn't wrestle in high school or, or it made it to my level, mm-hmm. then you can't touch my legs. So the, I'm sorry. That, that, I'm, there's nobody that just, like, I never wrestled, but I took you down. I'm like, no, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so that's never happened to you. That's interesting because uh, I, I've always thought, you know, how people talk about George St. Pierre, like being one of like the best non-wrestlers to become a really great wrestler. I've seen videos of him in like, you know, informal, not serious training sessions, you know, straight wrestling with people. It doesn't look too good. It's so different than what it's like in an MMA fight. So I guess like in wrestling practice at the gym, uh, people are going to be what they are as, as wrestlers. Uh, I, I don't know. I just thought maybe you'd surprise me. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. But, uh, I mean, this is no surprise. Like, Gregor Gillespie is fucking... Every time I spar, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> I would just punch him in the face and just hopefully he would stay there, but he'd shoot from, like, five feet away. I'd see it coming, and he would still somehow, like, figure it out. Like, But we'd also have, like, big 16-ounce gloves on, so I'd change yeah. it a little bit. You it's know? harder. Yeah, I hear you. So now that you're uh, pretty much officially retired, it, it seems like you, you've got a couple things going on. You're running your podcast. Is there any you know competition on the horizon? Grappling, wrestling? Uh, I'm I'm looking to uh because like I was saying before, like it's tough, you know, being motivated to you know. I guess not get fat, you know, like just when I'm just trying to like put on beach muscles, mm-hmm. uh, but a good like uh, push to, you know, be in shape and stuff like that is competition, you know, so uh, with my time being off, I'm like, I was thinking about like giving, you know, these no gi super jujitsu matches, maybe mm-hmm. you know, give me a reason to train and, and take something serious, you know. So it's on it's on your radar, but nothing official in the works yet. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, I can't go to the gym because the right, like, right. Of, the, uh, of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It's a good reason not to be in the gym. I don't know. This is a uh, this is going to be after this is going to release after UFC 249. But did you have thoughts about the main event, Tony Ferguson and Justin Gaethje? Yeah, I'm putting money on Justin Gaethje. Putting money My on man. Justin Gaethje. What's your thought <laughs> process there? We agree, by the way. He was just on my show yesterday. He says, "I know." He said, six or seven times out of ten, I knock him out. The other thirty-four percent, he chokes me out. So I might take those odds. (laughs) I might put 
money on Gaethje winning, and then maybe if there's like a line for like it not going past the second round. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's a smart bet. You ever trained with either of those guys? No. I've trained with Ferguson before. Okay. Yeah. Back back before I fought Clay Weed, I was in California training. Mm-hmm. And uh, my manager was like, all right, get some rounds with Tony. I was like, all right. Like, I've seen this guy fight. Like, he's really good. Like, so I was, like, on my A game. <laughs> and I was – I don't know if, like – he's he's definitely a gamer. Because mm-hmm. I was taking him down at will. And he wasn't hitting me with, like, any crazy, like, submissions. So I'm just like, I don't know. How does this guy win? I watch him fight after I spar with him. I'm like, then there's yeah. also, like, then there's guys that don't necessarily train their hearts with going with somebody just because they don't fucking know him, you know? But. It's being nice. Yeah, I guess, I mean, obviously you can't throw elbows in sparring. I guess some right. of the things he could have done, he, you know, you just don't do, but. Shin pads on, 60 ounce gloves. It makes it tough to roll for ankle hooks and heel hooks and shit like that, too. But I just remember being able to take him down. Like, I took him down probably four times in a round. I was like, so you're a big fuss, huh? <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Uh, so do you want to tell talk a little bit you know, about your podcast and your, your media ventures that you're going through? Yeah, you know, I have a deal podcast is. way better than this one. It's called. Yeah, I, I believe you. <laughs> I'm, I'm fucking. I'm fucking. With you. It's called the Menace of the Man Show. Uh, half the time I drink beers and shoot the shit with people, so we have a good time. And I try to talk to fighters. Um, I don't really give a fuck about their fights or what their training's <laughs> like because they're getting asked that like every day mm-hmm. in every interview they do. And being a fighter, I don't want to fucking talk about that shit because I actually do it, you know? So I talk, I try to like talk gym talk with them. Like, yo, man, you single? You got, you married? Whatever. What's your deal? Like, I'm single. Like, oh, yeah. You on, you on Tinder? Like, what are your pickup <laughs> lines? Do you party? Do you drink? Do you smoke weed? What's your, what's your vice? Oh, you eat clean all the time? Like, you fucking, you're a loser. I don't want to talk <laughs> Yeah, but I'm looking for, I'm looking to hear, I don't know. Or if there's, like, controversy or someone talking shit between each other, I'm like, yo, let me hear your side of it. Mm-hmm. That's but, pretty sick. Uh, yeah. Sounds but good. I, I'll, I'll definitely like, give it you know, a listen. Co- yeah, no, with, with, you know, with the competitions over that and, and the stakes being so high, it's not like it used to be. Like, we're fucking, like, Chuck Liddell was out, like, sniffing coke and being, you know, wasted. You know? Everyone's like trying to like, you know, the the, the room for errors is so minute that everyone's mm-hmm. you know. Wait, you Christian too? <laughs> Church boy, what's going on? There? <laughs> You're finding it more difficult to find interesting characters in uh in the sport. Well, there's people that, that'll admit it at least. It is interesting with you know. Everything going on, all the coverage, like, they're not trying to leak their... I'm pretty good at, like, getting people to open up, you know? Mm-hmm. But, uh... Yeah. All right. That's all That's all I got. Philippe, do you have a closing closing question? No, nah, that was cool. No, nah, that was fun. That's pretty well, sweet. One well, of my things, you know? Mm-hmm. I like all that right. lot of fun. Cool. Well, you cracked me up. This was awesome. Yeah. Was <laughs> Learned cool. a lot, for sure. Yeah. Uh, definitely would you say it's the best day of your life? Yeah, I would say it's probably top one. Top one best days of my life. Wow. It's up there. Yeah. I'm talking about. Until you get Chad for me, then that's, you know, it's got to jump you <laughs> at, at that point. Hey, no, <laughs> no chance is Chad going to be as funny as me or say the wild things I just said. Oh, for sure not that, but, you know, just wish fulfillment. You know, I've had this dream so long of, of having Yeah, I'm time. trying to find a contact that make that we could go... And have chat before you, but that's gonna to be tough. Without paying him like five thousand dollars, because that's an option. But you know, I don't have that. <laughs> Nobody is funnier than me. I'm. I believe that for yeah, sure. I'm, yeah, I I'm believe that too. Having a hard time keeping it together, but you know, I'm, I'm a professional. Yeah. So. No, you're not. <laughs> you're in your bedroom. I'm in the kitchen, actually. Let me see that. Please. 
All right, let's uh, spin this around. I'm all hooked up to a bunch of stuff here. All right, so we got, uh, this is the, the back cabinet where the, where the dog food is, and there's a crock pot behind me, which indicates okay. that it's the kitchen. And uh, there's the window to outside, and uh, how can I turn this without unplugging the rest of my life? And there's a bunch of kitchen stuff. Okay. Little, little, little kitchen area. Can I give you a little pointer? Yeah, hit me up. Actually, you kind of are, aren't you? That's it. Try and shoot that camera in the corner. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting back in the back corner. So for, you can't for see that little flower. Oh, I like the flower. <laughs> or just put, like, a picture of me on there. Framed photo, like, right over here in this yeah, region. Yeah, take the crock pot out. Yeah. <laughs> so where are All you? Right. I'm in Philly. You're in Philly. Where are you at? I don't even know what kind of accent do you have? Where are you? <laughs> you asking me? Yeah, you're the only have an accent. accent on here. <laughs> I'm from Paris. I'm French. Oh, Paris. Oh, Did oh, you ever come to Paris? Okay. You can't write I work in a hotel. Actually, I manage a hotel. So if you want a free room, for sure, man. Just for one you night. You work in a hotel? Yeah, let me just, if I may. I can I can walk around the hotel. I just need and the you connection. Can get, you can get me a free room. If for one night. For that? one night. How many stars is that hotel? Uh, just just four. Just, just four. four. You know, in France, like the rooms, they are not as big as uh, in the states, but it's pretty cool. So yeah, if you after the the pandemic, if you ever come to Paris, shoot me up, dude, for sure. I give you like a a great room. All right, fucks with it, man. You guys eat a lot of croissants over there, right? Oh, you're breaking up. Yeah, hey, you're all choppy. Probably He's, walking around. It's, you know what is? Oh, uh, yeah, it's probably the hotel Wi-Fi. Yeah, I'm using my 4G because the hotel Wi-Fi is fucking shit. You got to pay the extra money to get the upgraded Wi-Fi, dude. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> is this all a door right, right now? Yeah. We'll get the tour of the hotel. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> you guys gonna eat tacos and, and drink uh, Coronas or tequila tonight? Yeah, brisket tacos, the real stuff. Oh, wow. All right. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm do you guys celebrate Cinco de Mayo over there in France? Dude, do, do you know what Cinco de Mayo is? When the Mexican whoop the French people, so we don't. Oh. <laughs> but I love Mexico, holiday. so I don't mind. I like Cinco de Mayo as a boxing fan. Any reason to smoke down some tacos. All right, guys. Done. Cheers. I'm out like a fat kid in dodgeball. All right. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks, we, man. We that was great. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Yeah, ciao, man.